to TL's Roadhouse in the house. It's Jason Aldean. What's up, man? Man, it's good to see you. Thank you for having us on tour. We yeah. enjoyed ourselves yesterday. Uh, we celebrated just a wee bit last night. Yeah, it's yeah. good, man. It's good to have you guys out. Good to get to catch up a little bit. Damn, you are selling some freaking tickets, dude. That's unbelievable. It's been uh, it's been a wild ride, man, you know, and it's, it's kind of crazy because I look and we've been, you know, around now i guess for 17 years or so and and uh you know still able to go out crowds are great and people still you know care enough to come out and and uh it's been it's been a fun ride for sure and this year just kind of seems like it's kind of kicked into another gear you know it's it's kind of crazy just uh i don't know if it's because everything slowed down for COVID and, and all those things. People are just excited to really get back out and, and do normal stuff again or, or what. But it's, uh, you know, lots of sellouts this year, which is great. Uh, it seems like uh, when everybody got, when we got past COVID, the crowds have been bigger, more intense. And, I, you know, if you go into a restaurant, they don't seem to be able to have anybody to work. There's a lot of people, that places, businesses that can't get employees. Somehow these people must be having they must be growing money in their backyard because they are spending money. Too, yes, absolutely. Without a doubt. Absolutely. I think people just, you know, being cooped up for a couple years or whatever it was, I think uh, you know, it's one of those things where you don't know don't know what you got till it's gone. And and so now that things are getting back to normal, I think people are, you know, not taking things probably for granted they used to and, and taking advantage going out and, and you know, going to shows, going to different things yeah. and uh it's it's fun. What was the uh the moment when you realized I'm in mean, your pinchy moment when you said, "Man, I finally arrived." Man, when when did you feel it? When did when did it, did it settle in to the point where it was like overwhelming? Because because it's all new and, and good for a while, but there comes a point when you go, "Wow, man, I just this is ever this is everything I dreamed of." Yeah, I mean, I, I think the first moment was uh, was at the ACMs, and I believe it was a, an award that you also won too. But it was it was the top new male vocalist yeah. that I won and. Uh, in 2005 and so i think for me i mean that was kind of i'd only been out you know i came out that year um and then i remember you know we got a nomination for an award show that i'd watched my whole life on tv and and all of a sudden you're sitting in the crowd and you actually win and i just remember getting up there my hat hit the microphone almost you know knocked my damn hat off and i was so nervous you know and it was just that was kind of the moment i think for me was like you know, not only do I have a record deal and, and, you know, a couple songs out, but like I'm getting accepted by, you know, the community, the industry as well. And I think that was kind of the first thing for me where, um, you know, I started to realize that, man, maybe this is a, you know, maybe this is going to work out a little bit. And, um, you know, I remember that being a pretty special night. You know, as a uh, fast forward to now, man, and uh, after 17 years and all the hits and all the successful tours and everything else, you know, uh, it's uh it's a hard thing when you start realizing that that all the people that you looked up to when you were growing up in the music business all of a sudden you're on the other side of that aisle and you got all these kids looking up to you and dreaming the dream man it's uh it's it's pretty it's pretty humbling when you kind of get to that spot isn't it yeah it is and uh, you know it's it's funny and and i'm sure you kind of feel this way too sometimes it's like you know there's part of me that feels like man i don't, I don't really feel like i've been around long enough to sort of have that impact on you know, newer artists that are coming up, and I, I don't think as as artists while we're doing our thing, we really understand like how much that's influencing kids that are sitting at home in their bedroom learning to play guitar and and doing all those things. And so now, you know, as, as some of these newer acts are coming up, you know, they come up and start telling me what a huge fan. Man, I went to see yeah. you when I was in middle school, and I'm like, damn, that makes me feel old. But I don't feel like I'm that old. So, but it, you know, it's cool, man. It's cool to to think that you know, you kind of left your mark on, on somebody else, you know, that that's coming up doing the same thing. I mean, you were that guy for me. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a cool thing when you kind of get to that point and realize you were doing something without even realizing you were doing it at the time, you know, you were influencing some of these guys and you didn't even know you were doing it, but, um, it's, uh, it's a cool feeling for sure. When you were a kid, man, what, uh, what was life like growing up? You grew up in Georgia? Yeah. Grew up in Georgia. My, uh, my parents got divorced when I was three. My dad was in the Air Force, um, and so we lived in in Homestead, Florida. I was I was born in Macon, Georgia, and my dad was stationed down in Valdosta. And so when I was like a year old, we moved to Homestead, Florida. And so by the time I was three, my parents got divorced. My dad stayed down there. My mom and I moved back to Jacksonville for like a year, and then eventually back to Macon, where all my mom's family was yeah. was at. And and so I was 
pretty much raised there in, in middle Georgia. And uh, my dad pretty much lived in Florida the whole time I was growing up. So I spent all my summers down there with him and, and, um, and, but was, you know, mainly with my mom most of the year. And, you know, it was, it was tough. I mean, my mom was a single mom, you know, raising me yeah. and, and, um, you know, it was just one of those things where we kind of had stuff that, uh, we, we needed to get by and to live and those things, but, you know, we didn't have a lot of extra stuff. And, and so, you know, it was, it was, uh, I would say a, probably lower middle class sort of upbringing for me. And, but, you know, at the time you're going through that stuff, you don't, I mean, you don't know any different. You just think that's how everybody is. And, and so, um, but, you know, I grew up playing sports and, and, you know, my mom was great about putting me into things. She knew I was big into sports. So, you know, always playing sports and, and, um, you know, really involved in those kind of things growing up until I kind of started getting into music at about, I don't know, 13, 14 years old, I wanted to start playing guitar because my dad and my uncle played guitar. And, uh, you know, I'd always loved music, but that was kind of the turning point where I picked up a guitar and started messing around with it a little bit to, to play with my dad and my uncle. Yeah. And, um, and you know, it just kind of went from there. My dad had a little little band that would kind of call it band. I'm using that term very loosely when I refer to this, but uh, there's a couple of his buddies that would come over, just kind of jam in the, in the living room. And, and so I started, you know, singing with those guys and, and just kind of went from there. But yeah. You got any siblings? I have one half sister. Gotcha. So my dad got remarried and uh, my sister Cassie is seven years younger than me. And um, so I have her, I have two stepbrothers, um, but, uh, but my real sister is, is my half sister. You know, I, I never realized until much later in my career, you know, uh, we, we dream this thing and we chase it and, and, you know, whatever good, bad comes out of it. And you kind of understand, I mean, you make the choice to get into it. Right. Uh, but I didn't realize how my career was going to affect my, my family. I mean, it affected mm -hmm. my mom, my dad, my siblings. I mean, it, it really, it affected a lot of things in my hometown. How did you, how did you deal with all that when it started? Uh, it, you know, I, t I talked about this a lot actually, but it was, it took me a little time to adjust, you know, and, and obviously with family who, you know, they're trying to just kind of figure it out as, and as people you start go. treating them different. Yeah. For I mean, sure. it changes everything. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I think it's, uh, I don't think people realize like, you know, and, and I don't mean to say this to sound like, you know, poor me, look at what, you know, oh, no, not at all. you know what I mean? No, but no. I think it's it's people don't realize like how tough that part of it is, um, whether it be your parents or your sister, or your kids, you know, at this point, like kids that uh, we were actually talking about this yesterday, like, you know, your kids go to school and, and just friends treat them different, you know, when they yeah. find out who they are. And, and so it's uh, it's it's tough, you know, and it's something that you kind of I don't, I don't necessarily know that I was prepared for that. And so it took me a little little time to, to kind of adjust to that. And, and I think everybody in my family as well. Um, you know, my, my mom, dad, my sister, all the way, you know, to my, my wife and kids, like everybody. And so, um, it, it was definitely something that took me a little time to get used to. I remember, um, my dad hated time marches on because in people's minds, man, so many people think that when you release them, even though I didn't write it, they thought that I wrote it and it was about my family. It was a true story. Right. So when it talks about daddy having a girlfriend in another town, he had to live with all that. <laughs> you know, so I never that never crossed my mind when I recorded something like that, the impact that it was going to have on people. Yeah. Hey, that's, it bothered know, him, man. Yeah. I've, I've dealt with that a little bit. And it's like, you, you realize this is a song, right? It's just, just a song. It's, a song. Man. it's yeah. like a movie, yeah. you know. It's not a movie about me. It's just a cool movie, cool song. When you walk out on that stage every night, man, does it ever get old to you? I mean, just walking out in front of that massive crowd and just feeling like... It's, there's no other feeling like it to me. And, you know, it's it's walking out and, and just when you kind of get that initial reaction of the excitement people get when they see you, to me, like, that's the yeah. that's the best part of the night, you know? And, and uh, no, I mean... You know, I'm I'm not a guy that goes and bungee jumps or like parachutes out of airplanes. Like I'm not that guy. Yeah. So you know, that's that's the way for me to to kind of get my feel of of an adrenaline rush. And so it's it's great. I mean, I love it. Uh, I, you know, I love pretty much everything about this business and and playing. It's why we all got into it. We love music. We love to you know be on stage and entertain people. Um, Sometimes the traveling sucks, you know, that part of it kind of gets old being away from home, missing out on things with family. And, you know, those are things that, 
you know, you kind of give up to be able to, to go out and do this stuff. But, um, you know, a lot of times it's, it's that, that initial pop when you come on stage is a lot of times what makes it all worth it. You know, and it's, uh, it's really addictive too. It's almost like a drug because you get so used to it. You know, even, even when you take time off to decompress and everything, there comes a point where it's like, I'm ready. I miss it. I, I've got to get back out there on that stage uh, because you don't get that rush anywhere else. No, you can't get all. it from anything. And, and I don't think, you know, I don't know. I feel like, and I don't know if you're like this, but if I'm home for too long or not playing, it's almost like you lose your sense of like who you are almost because you're so associated with music and and this being who you are that, you know, sometimes if I'm at home for a couple, two, three months, I'm like, you know, it's almost like I don't know what to do with myself because I'm so used to being out here and doing this. And so you almost lose touch with like, who am I anymore, you know? Do you do you get any of that anxiousness after you've been off work for a while? Usually if I've been down for a while, the first couple of shows, I, I, I get those butterflies back a little bit. When I'm first kicking off, just make sure all the stuff still works. Yeah, and, make sure know. I don't forget all the words, the yeah. songs, and, you know. And, yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, that's normal. It's, you know, once you get into the routine of, of shows and you're playing a lot of shows, it's, you know, you get into that routine, oh, yeah. and it's it's doubt. like second nature. But yeah, those those first you know first few shows are always a little a little nerve wracking, and especially and, with all this production and stuff. I mean, that's a whole other level. Making sure everything's yeah. dialed in. Are you a uh, are you really involved in in uh, production stuff? Like when you're going through designs and things, do you uh, you and your managers talk about all that stuff? How what's your process getting all that stuff put in place? Yeah, you know, I try to be really involved in all that stuff. Um, you know, I, I kind of consider that my playground up there. So I want it to be things that I think are cool, things that I think I'll use. You know, I don't want to go and spend a bunch of money to do some props or whatever that I don't feel like I'm going to use up there yeah. um, or something that I feel like we've done before. So I want to kind of stay on top of that. And, and so I'm pretty involved, like, in, in all those things. And um, I always kind of always have been. And, uh, you know, I feel like I know what I want to see when I go to a show and, and – I know what we do as a band, and I feel like I know what works for us on stage. So I try to stay pretty involved in all those things. You know, y'all, uh, you, you have a pretty progressive sound. Um, you catch some flack over that early on? Yeah, I mean, I think early on we did. And, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, but I also think that's part of what wor- what made it work for us, too. Absolutely. It was, so, it was so different than anything else that was out at the time. And, you know, where I'm from is like the – I mean, it's kind of the heart of Southern rock. I mean, the Allman Brothers kind of formed in my hometown, and uh, Otis Redding was from my hometown, Little Richard, um, you know, so Marshall Tucker, like all those guys would come there and record in, in yeah. Capricorn Studios. And so, man, when I was growing up, I just had this hodgepodge of, of music that I listened to, and, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, oh, well, that's country, and that's rock, and that's that. And so it was just like, man, if it's cool, it's it's cool. And, and so... I listen to everything, and I always love the instrumentation of rock and roll, but I love the storytelling and the vocals of country music. And so, you know, that was something that I was doing in the clubs in the early days, too, yeah. you know, playing Guns N' Roses and turn around and play Keith Whitley. So um, when I started making records, I think, you know, it was still me trying to figure that out in the studio and how to, you know, make all that stuff work because I, I kind of knew what I wanted to hear, but I, I hadn't really – perfected it yet really and so my band obviously coming in they played on all my records and really kind of helped to create the the sonic brand as far as the music went um you know all those guys are are rock guys and stuff and so it you know they were a big part of of helping us to kind of make all that stuff gel but yeah i mean we definitely took some some uh some heat early on and then when we did stuff like dirt road anthem you know we put in the the hip-hop stuff i mean you know it's like uh, that was a lot of people thought we were, you know, the antichrist of, of country music. And, um, you know, but sometimes, you know, I always say, man, sometimes you roll the dice and, you know, I feel like every time we've taken chances, it's it's paid off. And, and it's, you know, when we don't play it safe, we've had the biggest response. You were, uh, you were in uh, a, a different situation. When you got signed, you really weren't on what was considered a major label so right. to speak i mean i was kind of in the same situation with atlantic it was a glorified major it was a subsidiary uh, being on an independent did did you have a lot of creative control early because a lot of when you sign with a major man a lot of times you don't have that yeah well see i was signed to Capitol records first really i didn't yeah, know that yeah. yeah so i got signed to Capitol. i moved to nashville in 98 and um 
there was a guy named Larry Willoughby that was actually working at MCA at the time. Mm-hmm. And so he came to the studio that, that Michael Knox and I were recording in and after I was in town for like two months and told me that he wanted to sign me to MCA. We were getting ready to go into the Christmas break, so everything was shutting down in Nashville. You know how it is. And he just said, you know, after the first of the year, I want to get together and you know, I want to sign you to, to MCA. Well, right after that break, DECA records closed and they absorbed all those DECA acts over to MCA. So it was guys like, you know, I think it was Gary Allen and Red Akins and, you know, all those guys. <clears throat> so it really just kind of put the pause on it. Well, Larry ended up going to Capitol and I signed over there for about a year and, you know, never even recorded a song while I was over there. They had a change of, of label heads. Pat Quigley left, Mike Dungan came in and it just kind of all yeah. went away. But, you know, so for a few years I didn't. I didn't have anything really going on. Couldn't get another deal. And but you were working with Michael all the yeah, way. And the Michael time. Knox, by the way, for y'all that don't yeah. know, Michael's Michael's a Michael badass. Michael found me in a club in Atlanta in ninety eight and signed me to Warner Chapel writing songs. That's how I came to Nashville. And um but, you know, after getting dropped from Capitol, you know, it was a few years where I didn't have couldn't get a deal, couldn't get anything going on, and then this Broken Bow Records comes to the table, which I, you know, really didn't know anything about them at all. Because, well, nobody like did. you said, they yeah. they weren't a major player in town. And so, you know, I signed over there, and I remember having a a conversation with the head of the label, Benny Brown, who, you know, was the one that signed me there. And he just said, um, you know, he was talking about me cutting records and whatever. And I just said, man, listen, you guys signed me based on what I've been doing in the studio. And this, this is me cutting stuff with my band, with my producer, like, just let me do my thing. That's why you signed me. So don't mess with it. And so to their credit, they did. Um, they from basically from album one, they let me go in and, and kind of cut my records the way I wanted to. They would fight me sometimes on, on singles. Um, you know, maybe I wanted a single that they wanted something else. And so I kind of fought that a little bit on a, on a few songs early on. So I think there was some things that got released that I, probably wouldn't have picked myself yeah um but you know to an extent you kind of got to play ball at first especially when you're an unproven act and, absolutely you know you don't you don't really have that uh respect i didn't realize the guys in the band played on have they played on every record every record yeah Man, that's, i absolutely. didn't realize that and so um when it kind of when things kind of changed was when i we cut the my kind of party record michael and i just went in didn't didn't play the label any songs didn't run them anything by them we just went in and cut that album and when I went to turn it in, uh, they were a little upset with me because I hadn't ran anything by them. And and I remember them saying, well, maybe we should make you just pay for the whole album. And I was like, well, you give me the points that you're getting for the album, and I'll give you my points, and I'll pay for the record. And uh, they didn't say anything <laughs> else after that, and I never had another thing. Like, at that point, I think it was when they kind of, you know, I kind of gained some respect for them because we were coming off of an album where we had just had She's Country and Big Green Tractor. And so we were starting to get a little bit of their respect from the label already. And so I think, you know, when my kind of party came out and did what it did, you know, I think to this point, it's now, now they platinum. To, to give them credit, man, they, I know Benny came from the automobile industry, mm-hmm. but he had the presence of mind to hire really well seasoned people on that staff. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of really good record people there at that label that yes, knew their salt. Man. Absolutely. And, you know, and Benny's super intelligent guy too. I mean, he's, um, That's yeah. a hard transition to make. Well, man. he he opened a record company because he just didn't like the music he was hearing on the radio. So he was like, I could just I'm gonna just go open a record company and sign guys that I like and change what I'm hearing on the radio was basically his mentality. And yeah. and you know that label was around for a few years before anybody really knew what was going on. I think they finally started having some hits with Craig Morgan yep. uh, and Sheree Austin. I think were the two that they. You know, kind of eventually started breaking through and having some hits with some people like that, and that was right after that was when I came on board. Um, and so, you know, it was it was you got to give him credit for starting that and, and putting all the people in place to to make it fly. That's John Lobo, money, yeah, John Lobo was running, yeah, still is kind of running everything over there, and um, you know the promotion staff they had, and and a lot of those people are still there, been with me my whole career, and uh, they're just. They're great. So he, he did have a great crew over there. I didn't realize that, uh, see, in 99, I guess all the, about that same time frame, 98, 98, 99, was when Nashville was starting to roll back in on itself because as I, I remember getting a call from the head of Atlantic one day, and he said, uh, Atlantic is closing. 
uh, this was 1999. And uh, if you want to roll over to Warner Brothers, they'll let you stay on your album uh, path and you can go ahead and cut your next record, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, you know, uh, what they didn't tell me was that uh, uh, Giant and Reprise were all closing at the same time. So all of a sudden, Warner Brothers got went from like non artists to like <laughs> everybody's yeah. over there. So, I mean, you just kind of got lost in the shuffle. And uh, so I, I didn't realize that Decca and a lot of the other majors were in the bringing back in a lot of their smaller labels their smaller imprints and stuff yeah. at that time too yeah well yeah well, i mean we ran into that and you know for me you know being on a little independent label i mean you know i say this all the time and it's like i've had talks with mike dungan who dropped me from capital yeah. you know and and we've talked and he's just like you know it was the best thing that could have happened for me you know because i i don't think i would have done what what has happened in my career had I been anywhere else other than where I was at with a label that was willing to kind of roll the dice, let me do, you know, my thing. And, Absolutely. and, um, you know, things, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in things happen for a reason. And, you know, it's been fun to kind of be there from, from ground zero with that label and watch them kind of build it up. And, you know, now you got, you know, a lot of, you got Dustin Lynch and Jimmy Allen and, and, Lanny Wilson, who's killing it right now, you know, so, so the label has grown into like putting out, you know, real artists, man. And like, you know, really moving the needle and, and to be part of that the whole time has been, been and they've, they've murdered, they got, uh, bought up and BMG. Was, yeah. Bought them. Yep. Yep. So that, so that, that, down. that probably changed everything as far as the perception and, and just the way the label was run too. Right. I mean, we'll just, just well, Loba's still there. Loba's still there, but you know, it just, I think just to have that presence of being a, a major player now, even though, you know, they were having success as a independent label, you know, you still don't have almost have that respect of being that major label. So once yeah. BMG came on board, it, it kind of gave them that significance and, um, you know, that, that they never had before and, and that I never had as an artist being over there. You know, I was, yeah. felt like, you know, when it comes to award times or, or things like that and, you know, this label's got however many votes they got to, to pass around and my little label's got like five, you know. So it was, you know, you kind of fight in that battle you know my whole career really yeah. and so it was it's cool to be over there somewhere now that's considered a major yep what was the uh, first big thing you bought when you first when you started making money um <clears throat> i remember the first thing that i bought that was like uh just because i could you yeah. know it was like I, I was taking my daughter i think my oldest daughter i was taking her to uh to a softball game and so i passed this car dealership and i looked over and there was a it was a used Jeep, like a two-door Jeep Wrangler, but it was lifted and looked cool. And so I, I kind of stopped by there, and I was like, hey, man, how long are you guys going to be open today? And he told me. And so I went to the ball game, came back by, and I was like, I just I want to buy that Jeep. And didn't test drive it, didn't do anything. And it was used. It wasn't even new. <laughs> and uh, I was just like, yeah, I just, I've always wanted a Jeep, and that one looks cool. And and I can, so just I won't, give me the keys. <laughs> it's nice to be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, so that was the first thing I remember buying that was like, you know, something other than like a, I don't know, a pair of boots or something. But yeah. You know what I mean? Something substantial. But yeah. I mean, to me, it was like paying a hundred bucks for tennis shoes. I'd be like, man, I'd have to like save all year for that kind of stuff before. Oh, now I'm like, yeah, I'll just take a Jeep, you know? <laughs> so, uh, uh, DJ Silver was just up here and we, we got sat and visited a little bit. He told me to ask you about the chiggers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about the chiggers, man. So, so Silver is not a big, not a big hunter. He's not really He's not a, big, a real outdoorsy no, guy. Not, no. not at all. He's actually the opposite of outdoorsy. <laughs> Yeah, he's like video game guy, you know, just if it's if it's air conditioned, that's him. Right. <laughs> so I take him out to this hunting lease I had, and this was years ago. It was me and Chuck Wicks, who is now my brother-in-law, but this was years before he even met my sister, and he and I were friends. And So we had a hunting lease together, and I go out there, and I'm we're hanging, hanging deer stands. And uh, I get out there, and, we're, you know, we're, we're in – thigh high grass most of the day and just working and not really paying attention to, to whatever. Well, I get home, you know, don't, don't shower immediately. I'm in there eating dinner, doing whatever, take my shower, man. The next day I am covered. And I mean, like all in places you do not want to have chiggers, my man, it is like from, from knee to other knee and everywhere yeah. in between. And it is like, and I had had them before a little bit, but that was like the worst I'd ever had them. And, uh, yeah, silver would come on my bus, man. And I'd just be like clawing my legs and it was, it sucked for about two weeks. 
You know, it's uh, it's been pretty pretty cool to see uh, what you've done in regards to him. I know that I don't know where you found him at, but being bringing a DJ out and kind of putting him in that situation. I mean, you were instrumental in all that, and it changed it changed that in country music. Everybody's doing it now, but he yeah. was the first one. Y'all were the first ones to do that. Yeah. Was that something that you got from watching other rock acts or going to big festivals and stuff before? Where'd you get that from? You know, I th I think I got it from. Uh, you know, just I remember going to shows, you know, yeah. and, and you would see an act and then there would be this 30 minute intermission where the lights come on and, you know, there's nothing really happening. It's kind of yeah. boring. You know, everybody goes and gets a beer, goes to the bathroom and it's just kind of boring for 30 minutes. And it, it's kind of hard to, like, get ramped up for the next one. And so I met somebody had told me Silverwood. He had mixed up a song that I had. I think it was She's Country and. Yep country grammar or something like Nelly, you know, and he had done something and somebody wanted to introduce us. It was my agent, Kevin Neal. And, um, so he introduced us and, and I just kind of started talking to silver about coming out and like, Hey man, why don't you just come out and like play some music in between acts, kind of keep everybody in a good mood, keep everything going and, and just we'll see how it goes. And so he came out with me and it's been, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago now, but, uh, he came out for, for one year to do it one tour and we just kind of hit it off, became really good friends. And, and uh, and that was kind of where it started. And th next thing you know, like we had Luke was coming out. Luke Bryan was coming out and, you know, opening shows for us. And then the next year he started headlining. And a couple years later, he had a DJ out on the road with him. So it, it turned into like a thing where, you know, a lot of guys are doing it now. But, um, you know, I met Silver in Vegas and it was just like, a, you know, let's try this and see how it goes. Yeah, was, doesn't Jelly Roll have one? I think what he was saying he was going to have one. I, pr I think yeah. so. I think I, I, I haven't seen Jelly's show, but I would imagine that's a completely different. Yeah, scenario. I bet he's got one just like, probably even. I don't for think on he has stage. a band, but he yeah. don't have a band. Yeah, I think yeah he just. I think there yeah. he's got a scratcher or whatever. Though. Yeah, probably for his music too. You know, just a different different yeah. deal. But um, but Silver was yeah. It was just one of those things we met in like a, a restaurant in Nashville. I think it was or in uh, Vegas and and just was like, hey, want to come out on the road for a tour and try this out? And he's like, yeah. Yeah, let's so, go, man. So there we go. And now, um, you know, now him and his wife and me and my wife, like, you know, we kind of best friends, kind of do everything together. Our kids are like right at the same age. So two boys that are the same age, two girls that are the same age. And so it's uh, it's turned into a not only a cool working relationship, but a cool friendship, kind of family relationship too. That's a good thing. What's your what's your song process when you're putting an album together? How do you how do you? Do, I'm, I'm sure you write a lot for it. Do you find outside stuff? Do you listen to a bunch of outside stuff? I'm mostly outside stuff. Um, you know, like I said earlier, I mean, I moved to Nashville as a songwriter, writing for Warner Chapel, and and it was something for me that was kind of like a way to get to Nashville, get yeah. my foot in the door. I could write songs. I didn't. I never loved doing it, but I could do it. Um, and so it was like once my kind of career took off and you know i had a couple things on the first album that i wrote um and then i was just like i was more interested in on, getting on the road and playing i don't you know i don't want to yeah. sit in a room for a few hours a day because that's i got the attention span of a, a six month old man so um it drives me nuts and so for me i, I cut a lot of outside songs and um you know, Michael's been really instrumental in like helping find songs. And usually everything we cut either comes from stuff he finds or stuff that I find. Uh, we started a publishing company a couple years ago. So we got a couple writers writing for us as far as that goes. So, yeah. you know, and, and guys that are writing for us, they wrote, I mean, my last, they wrote a song for us called Blame It On You that, that went number one. They wrote uh, Trouble With A Heartbreak, the big Carrie Underwood duet that we had. Yeah. And uh, even the single that we got out now, uh, that's what Tequila does. So all that stuff came from inside our publishing company, which is which has been really cool to kind of have another avenue to go to find songs. You you know you kind of have some stuff in house, and you can go out and and look, you know, at some of the other publishers and writers that we know in town. But um, I'm a I'm hard on songs, man. I, I take them and I have a, a folder on my phone that I'll. As I find stuff, I'll yep. stick it over there, and I just listen to stuff non nonstop. And um, if I ever start getting tired of them, I'll take it and move it out of the folder and kind of put it in another folder. And, you know, the ones that, that are still in the folder, when it comes time to cut the record, those are the ones that typically make the album. And so um, I'm usually sick of those songs by the time we put them on a record. Yeah. But you know, you know how it goes. Absolutely. But, you know, I'm actually trying to write a little bit more for this next one, though. So... Um, so hopefully, you know, I'll get back in the writing game a little bit. Is there a, is there one that you missed that you just didn't hear that somebody else had a hit on? Yeah. Um, 
it was a song actually Luke cut it um, song called uh, Drunk on uh, Drunk on You I think it was it's the one that goes girl make my speakers go boom boom it's uh, on it so I got pitched that song I think Rodney Clawson was one of the writers on it and uh, they had pitched it to me and I was on a plane going to Vegas listening to songs and I and I, if I remember right we had a lot of my album was done and um, we were kind of looking for like specific stuff like tempo or, or whatever it was and and so that wasn't it and i remember liking yeah. the song but it was just like man we that's not what i'm looking for today and so i passed it and the next thing i know luke comes to my house and wants to play me his new album and i hear that song and i'm like damn it <laughs> that's a good one i miss that one so you know it happens man it, it does it but does. that's that's the one that i really remember that kind of sticks out that went on to be a, a big hit yep when uh, when you're not on the road, what's uh, what's your day to day life look like? I know you hunt, you fish. What what are your outlets? You know, I like to play golf, um, so I, I, I do that a lot. I mean, I, like I said earlier, man, I grew up playing sports, and so I'm I'm into anything as yeah. far as that goes. Uh, baseball season's happening right now. I'm a big Braves fan, so they're you know looking like they're going to be in the playoffs, making another run for yeah. hopefully a World Series. So you know, I'm excited about that. College football just started last week, so I'm excited about that. Um, but you know, when I'm at home, it's, it's, uh, my wife and kids, man, I like to hang out with them and, you know, home, home time for, for me is probably a little different than most. And, you know, and, and for you too, like, yep. you know, you're away from home so much that it's actually kind of nice when you get to go home and be there and spend some time and do like normal stuff. So for me, you know, getting up and taking my kid to school or, you know, going and picking her up from practice, going and watching games and like all those things. Like I love all that stuff. So, uh, when I'm at home, I try to do that, spend as much time with them as possible. And, and, uh, if I get a, you know, a day here or there, I may go hit some golf balls somewhere yep. or something, but Saturdays and Sundays, I'm watching football. I don't really care Amen. what's going on on, on Saturdays <laughs> or Sundays, but so obviously a Georgia Bulldog fan. I see yeah. you yelled at some. I saw that lone Georgia fan out there in the crowd with their little sign up, <laughs> positioned right in the middle of the room. Yep. Yep. There and, he was. Yeah. I'm. A, you know, I, I grew up. Uh, I don't know about an hour and a half south of Atlanta. So obviously a big Braves fan. Yeah. Uh, my whole life and and uh, my first memories of Georgia football were Herschel Walker. So you know, I think they were. I was three the last time they won a national championship and Herschel played for them. So you know that was my first memories of of. Georgia football was the heyday, you know, before last year was their only heyday. And uh, so, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge Georgia fan. Um, my sister graduated from there, and a lot of my family members have. I didn't go to college, so they didn't have to worry about that with me. But, you know, <laughs> I used to go there and hang out and play some shows, but uh, never went to class there at Georgia. You and I have a, a similar ideology as far as uh... – Things of the world, things going on in the world. I want to dive that one. What's the last rabbit hole you went down? Because I find myself chasing some crap that just there's. What's the last one you went down? I, man, I don't know. Um, I think it's so easy to do now on social media. You know, you just go on there and you click on a, you know, see a story, you click on it, and next thing you know, you're clicking on another one and clicking yeah. on it, and then you complete. And then, and then all of a sudden, you're a flat earther. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, you get you start going down this, like you said, a rabbit hole, and eventually you land on something that it's it's not even what you initially started to look at before, and it's like it's so weird. But I don't remember anything in particular. But um, I feel like I do that all the time. You know, it's like I got caught up in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard crap. Oh, I was all I over just, that. I, I swore I wasn't going to do it. I fought it off and fought it off for a couple of weeks, and it's like, well, crap. And then I got started, and then I was in it. Well. Yeah. Queen Elizabeth died yesterday, yep. right? So I'm I've learned more about the royal family in the last two days than I ever <laughs> knew before. You know what I mean? I'm like, so who's a prince and who's a? I'm so confused. They're all changing their titles now, and I'm like, everybody's stepping up to the next level. They they all move up. Or I, I, no, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure it out. But see, it's, I, I, I'm telling you what, man. I just that's uh, what I, happens when you're on the road and you got too much time on your hands. Is actually what. And what here's that what is. happened to me. So I was I was digging around on the internet and I stumbled across this thing where it said that uh, what I, which I didn't realize, but if you're a landowner in Scotland, that uh, uh, you can legally be titled a lord or a lady. So there, I went to this website that uh, I bought some property over the internet in Scotland. <laughs> One square foot. <laughs> I just got my certificate in the other day. So Lord I'm officially Lawrence. Lord Tracy Lawrence. I can't I can't call you that, buddy. 
I can't, well, I, I can't do it. I think a lot of you, but I can't do that. <laughs> I told the band, y'all going to have to get used to this. I got the certificate. Yeah. I'm getting ready to frame it and put it up here on the bus. Yeah, his, <laughs> his majesty. Yeah, I would expect a curtsy or a tip of the hat or something. Man. Yeah. <laughs> get you a bedazzled cowboy hat from now, like a jewels. Can like we a put crown. a bidet on the bus? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, man, I just, I've had so much fun with it, giving everybody a hard time. My wife said, well, can I be called a lady since I'm your wife? I said, you got to buy your own. <laughs> <laughs> I like to give my wife a hard time. This man. this piece of grass is in my name alone. Yeah, it's mine. You got to do Lord something. Lord Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you got an interest in going into acting, man. I see Trace. Trace has done so well, man, that, that whole Monarch thing. I hadn't watched it yet, but it looks like he's starting to make some progress. I was on a couple of... Uh, I ran into him when I was auditioning for a couple of things. I backed off of it, but he's doing well, man. You got any desire to go down that path? Uh, I don't know. You know, I did a movie years ago called Sweetwater, which really? you probably haven't seen because most people didn't. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I did this movie. It was a Western, and um, it was it had Ed Harris was in it and January Jones. And so it was, it was cool, you know, and it was something I think at the time I was interested in trying to see if it was something that I really wanted to pursue or not. And uh, I figured out pretty quick that I'm a musician. Yeah, yeah you know, didn't enjoy not, it that not, much. Not really, especially the movie thing. I think if you did like, a, you know, maybe like a sitcom thing might be a little better because it's quicker. You know, movies like you got to be there on site, and like it's for months. A lot of sitting around waiting for somebody else to film their stuff before you go in for you know ten minutes and do yeah. your thing, and so. I feel like a sitcom is a little more fast paced and they kind of get what they need to get, knock it out and it's, it's done. But a movies, it's, it would have to be something really cool, really special that, um, I think we ought to do like, uh, like Willie and all those guys used to do, man, let's get a bunch of us together and just make a Western. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. I don't I mean, know if we anybody would go see it, but we, you know, we'd have a good time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody liable to get hurt. We need to put a real actor <laughs> in it. Trace. Yeah, we'll, come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But, you know, I, I just learned that it was cool. It was cool to say I did it. Yeah. Um, but I didn't really love it. You know what I mean? It was it was cool to get the experience and, and kind of have it there to be able to say that I did it. But I didn't love it to where I was just like, I had, gotta the, do had the bug and wanted to go back and do it. I was, I figured out quick that I enjoy this a lot more. I, uh, I what was it? I uh, I did a movie. It's been a couple of years ago, uh, where I actually it was so bad, but it was uh, it was it's probably about, a, it's, Alabama Dirt's what it was called, and it was about this dirt track race car driver in Alabama, and it was just I my wife was actually the big woman from uh, Police Academy from years ago. She's like twenty years older than me, and I head taller than I am. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was it was a great experience. You could probably but, find that movie in the same two dollar yeah, bin it, at it, Walmart that my movies it in. It pops right? up on Netflix from time to time, and it's really bad. I'm very ashamed of it and I, I did another one a while back called visions where i actually got to play this doctor this eye doctor it's kind of a sci-fi horror movie it's really bad too but yeah those are my i gotta check these out yeah man. they're so bad yeah well i these. love bad movies man they're if you, if you want to feel better about yourself go watch my movie <laughs> you don't blink or you'll miss me and I'm, I'm one of these guys that when i get locked in on a bad movie i I, I find it. I take the challenge of having to see it through to the end. Yeah. It's really bad. A couple of them, the worst ones. You ever heard of a movie called Rubber? It's about this tire that's possessed, that rolls around, and it kills people. See, it's got a great plot to I'm it. Our, remember, you remember <laughs> earlier when I said I have the attention span of a six-month-old? Yeah. I got about, for a movie like that, I got about ten seconds. And I'm like, fuck, fuck this, man. <laughs> I don't know, man. Sometimes it's like it's just, ten minutes of my life I'll never get back. I'm so good. obviously you're not a reader. I'm a I'm a article reader. Okay, you know what I mean. Like I'm I'm not a book reader, but I'm a like a, like Reader's Digest has like articles. Like I'm I'm good for like short stuff. Yeah. Um, getting into a book and it being like a commitment to a book, eh, not so much. Have Have you discovered anybody uh, uh, music wise that you really dig? Even if it's not even country, somebody that you kind of stumbled across on Spotify or something. Anybody cool that you're listening to? Um, you know, I I, I like Post Malone, man. I, I like what he does. I like his stuff. Um, I think it's really cool. I heard a kid the other day, uh, Corey Kent. He's got a song called Wild as Her or something. And I thought that was really cool. I I didn't don't know anything about him, but it came on, and I remember kind of shazamming it going who is this you know and it's yeah. uh you know how it is you're when you're listening to the radio or something you hear a voice you're, you hadn't heard before and you feel like you know everybody so you hear one you haven't heard and you're like 
wait, what is that? And so, but it was this kid that I thought was, you know, had a really cool sound. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I kind of do stuff like that, but there's nobody, you know, I don't know. I, Morgan Wallen, I, I love it. Morgan's, oh, Morgan's doing, great, man. He's, uh, he was out on tour with us for a little bit and I've known him for quite a few years now. And so um, he was one, you could just kind of see it brewing. You knew it was about to, to happen for him. And, and um, you know, I really... I really like what he's done so far too. So he uh, he went through the fire, you know. Oh yeah, and survived it. That's a good. Oh thing. yeah, I had I, I had a few talks. I had a few talks with Morgan during that yeah. during those days, and and uh, you know, I just feel like that's one of those things where, you know, we all kind of go through our thing, you know, and yeah. and uh, life's about learning lessons, and you know, it's it's if you learn from from things you do, and and you know you don't do them again that's cool <laughs> you know what i mean absolutely i mean it's part of life it's learning and making mistakes and getting through it well and everybody's so judgmental nowadays man any little thing can be taken out of context i mean and, and the next thing you know you got this army of whatever they are that's like attacking <laughs> you you know what i mean yeah oh i know what you mean <laughs> do i uh, ever i stumbled on this guy and he's really started to get some recognition there's a, a kid named marcus king Real soulful guy, man, that I stumbled on two or three years ago. Blues guitar player. I mean, just a singing freaking Jesse, man. He's he's bad at the bone. If you get a chance, check him out. He's yeah, cool. Absolutely, man. I like all that stuff. Junior, what you doing over there? Man, I got a question for you. Come on. What's up? So, so Tracy, he's known for these road pranks and everything. What, what's a good road prank story? One that's happened to you? One that you've been a part of or, or one that you've heard of? Um, I don't know. I don't really know that I've ever had a bad one pulled on me that I can remember. Um, I remember McGraw one night when I was on stage, he came over to the, it was like, I think the last night of the tour and he comes over and gets the microphone where my, my ear monitor guy is, you know, where he kind of talks to us in our in ears and I'm trying to sing. And all of a sudden I hear somebody like talking or singing a different song or like something. And I'm like trying to hear my band and all I can hear is McGraw. <laughs> Like That's right cool. in the middle of my show, and he's singing Don't like take the girl. Yeah, he's singing like Indian Outlaw, and I'm singing, you know, Dirt Road Anthem or whatever. And it's just like, what in the hell is going on? Right, I look over and he's laughing over there at the side <laughs> stage. So that was a pretty good one. That's a good one because it's hard to, you know, it's hard to come back. You're just like completely lost in the middle of the song at that point. So yeah, that was a pretty good one. And then I heard, uh, you know, I've heard of people like putting dumping a ton of crickets on people's bus and <laughs> those kind of things <laughs> yeah. yeah is that your kind of deal i did it once i bird didn't speak to me for a long time after that i mean <laughs> people say well, where'd you find crickets at bait shop <laughs> i mean yeah you I don't know how you get rid of them you, you don't know? you you spread a thousand the crickets bus. on the bus he told me he said that it was summer it's like july he said they had to take it to a parking lot and turn it on and crank the heat wide open for about three days they're down to the walls he said you get on there later i mean <laughs> he was so mad at me oh was, that, that would be horrible <laughs> it was you know I, I put pigs in kenny chesney's state room one time you know, <laughs> on the chickens on stage all yeah. that what the message that's I heard? why i keep my damn bus lock man. one of the messages i heard was packing peanuts the entire bus like neck deep. now that's fun packing peanuts How do you get them there though those things are annoying as hell because they get <laughs> staticky you know what i mean they're stat and then they just stick to you everywhere you can't they're the worst. I hate getting a damn just a little box that has those things in them. So uh, when I when I first got in yesterday, I, I sat down and uh, we we ate had dinner last night, and uh, I uh, was looking at your tattoo, and I I realized that uh, I had gotten virtually the same tattoo, and I didn't realize you had it till like a week after I got it. Sure, you didn't realize that. <laughs> my wife said, "Come here and look at this," and I'm like, "What well, crap?" So my plan is I'm gonna have time marches on put here, and my fiddle player is gonna score the whole thing with the music notes and wrap it around so it is a little bit different because I have to do that. Uh, hey, it yeah. just means I know great, you had my poster months. on the wall. And I all did, that. I did. That's funny. I did. So this is this is like super weird to say now, but. He used to have this. He used to have this poster. I think it was a Justin Boots or a Wrangler poster yeah. where you were sitting on a Harley or yeah. something. I think it was a Stetson cowboy. Hat. Stetson, Stetson, yeah, Stetson, yeah. And so I saw it in this in this uh, Western store. I went in and I used to go in there all the time and, and buy stuff. And so I talked to the old man that owned it into letting me have that damn poster. And so I had a picture of his mug hanging over my bed for a few <laughs> years there back in the day. 
I tell everybody, I said, yeah, Jason had me on his wall. I had Farrah Fawcett. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I had some chicks up there too, but you know, you were, you were, it is what it is. You were the least attractive one on the wall. God, I, I hope so. That. God, I hope so. <laughs> so, uh, what's, uh, what are you doing right now? Are, are you working on a new album? Uh, not really. I mean, we just kind of finding songs for it right yeah. now. Um, Change of direction. You got a got a theme for it. You kind of nothing. I, I, I don't ever really go in with that that mentality, man. It's it's more of like I feel like the songs will kind of dictate where we go musically, and um, you know, I obviously try to find things and that maybe we haven't done before, or, or things that will change it up from things we've done recently. Um, but I don't. To be honest, I don't put a whole lot of thought into it until we get in the studio and start kind of playing around with it. Um, right now, I'm just trying to find songs, and then I think the tour goes through the end of October. So I would probably assume, like somewhere around the first of the year, we'll go in and and uh, start tracking new record. But we do we cut our records so fast anymore that it's you know I mean we'll go in and probably three days we can track the entire record. Oh yeah, and then I'll go in and do you know, two or three vocals a day. And, you know, so we can turn a record around. Once we have the songs, we can turn the record around pretty quick. And and so it's not a long, drawn-out process. It's like a lot of times I'll wait till we have pretty much all the songs, and then we'll go in and just kind of rip through them all just to make sure that we're kind of in the same vein for the whole record, kind of has that same sound. And um, that's kind of where we are right now. So I would assume we'd probably go in somewhere around January, February. So you're you're winding this down. When uh, when you do duets, you've done a couple of them. Uh, does the label bring that stuff to you? Do you and Carrie kind of talk about it beforehand, or find a song first? I, How did that one happen? So with this album, it was my tenth album, and you know we decided to, you know, we, it was during the COVID stuff, so we had a lot of extra time there to to kind of make this record. And with it being the tenth one, we wanted to do something a little different. So we decided to make it a double album and put some live tracks on there and all those things. And so the one thing we were kind of missing was like, man, we really don't have that that one big moment, you know, that that kind of standout thing on the record that that's uh, something other than just me singing a song. Yeah. Um, and so we kept, you know, trying to find these songs that that weren't really written as duets, but we were trying to force them to be a duet, and and it just wasn't happening. So um, a couple of the guys in my band and and John Morgan, this new artist we're working with. Uh, basically just went in and, and said, Hey, let's just try to write a duet. And, and so they go in and one night do a, like a 7 PM, write, write that night, write this song, you know, demo it that night, everything. And so the next morning they sent it to me and they were like, I think we got a duet for you. And I listened to the first verse and chorus and turned it off, called my manager Clarence and just said, Hey, I'm sending you a song. I need you to get Carrie's camp on the on the phone now. And so you knew exactly who you wanted. Yeah. yeah. And so and it was kind of the same way when we did the uh, the Kelly Clarkson thing. I mean, we had this song. Jason Sellers was a writer on that, and and um, it was just like, man, this is this is great. Like this could be a huge duet. And you know, and the first question out of everybody's mouth is, well, who do you think? And she was, you know, Kelly was off American Idol, you know, not long before that and, and just was really having a bunch of hits, pop hits at the time. And I think she's got I love you know, her this voice. soulful, just Absolutely. really cool voice. And so she was the first person that came to mind. I didn't know her, never met her. And, uh, but Clarence and, and Narvel were friends. And I think Narvel was kind of managing her. She was kind of in that camp somewhere. So that was kind of how it all went down. And um, first time I ever met her was in the studio. So... Uh, but typically, you know, I had Drowns of Whiskey, which, you know, was more of a country thing that, you know, I f Miranda was the one that, that was on that. And yeah. I just felt like that fit her, uh, fit her style more. And, and so, you know, I kind of just take the song and look and see, like, who I like, who who I'd like to work with. And, and if I get a song that, that works for them, you know, send it their way. And all they can say is no at that point. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Do you? How long do you think you'll be doing this? Do you think you'll get to some point? Do you have a target date in mind? You think you'll you'll do it for a long, long time? I mean, it's kind of past the the financial issues. Yeah, of all, you know. Uh, well, that's it. I mean, I don't you know I don't do this for for the financial aspect. I mean, at first you, you know it because you love it. I mean, yeah, yeah. but it, I mean, at first you're starving and you you know you're trying to make a better life for for you and everybody in your family and you know we're we're past that at this point. But you know, I, I always say like I I think. I'll know, like I, you know, as long as I enjoy it, as long as I love, you know, coming out on the road, playing shows, and and still truly enjoy what I do, and people 
seem like they care enough to come out and, and watch. You know, it, it's I think those will be the telltale signs. Either I get tired of doing it and just don't want to do it anymore, which I feel like this is kind of a lifer gig. I mean, absolutely, you're a it's musician. A yeah. It is. I mean, it's it's not something you just you know like an athlete where you get too old to do it and you just walk away because you can't. I mean, you can always as sing. long as long as you got the chops and you can still go out there and and the fans are still coming and joining. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think that's it. I think you know the only way it. it you know, I walk away as if I get tired of doing it or fans get tired of, you know, they're just not into it anymore. And, it, you know, and I think you'll know. I, I think when that time comes, if it comes, uh, you know, you'll know. And so that's when I'll just peace out. I'll go to the beach and you can just come down there and hang out with me. We'll go awesome. fishing. Let's go fishing. Yeah, then. let's do it. And thank you for your time, brother. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate you having me out. I hope we get to do a lot more of these shows down the road. It's a pleasure sharing the stage with you. Well, I love it, man. You know, I mean, you've always been one of my musical heroes. So anytime I get a chance to hang out with you and play some shows, I'm all about it. Appreciate that, brother. Yeah, Jason man. Jason Aldean. Thank yep. you, partner.